Thank you, Les. You really evoked like a feeling here for me. Oh, very calming. Mm. I know. I, I feel it in my soul right now. I don't know if I'm ready to start. <laughs> Hi, Barrett. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, if you're joining again from yesterday, um, we're so happy that you decided to come back. Um, Seda, um, one half of Sama Sama, Les that opened up for us and created such a nice uh, sound and ambience for us is, is the other part of Sama Sama. We have partnered with uh, the Sustainable Culture Lab to host this festival together, the Alters Festival, stemmed from Barrett Pittner's project, the Sustainable Culture Lab's founder, um, Alters project, which we'll uh, touch on a little bit. Um, but, you know, as if you all joined with a little bit of understanding of the intention of this three days was to kind of create space around traditions uh, in new and old that create space to honor our ancestors, as well as um, creating space for healing and uh, supporting one another on a community uh, collective way um and three sort of different themes so yesterday we touched on um ancestry and heritage today we're going to talk a, a little bit about the intersection of um sort of our multicultural you know identities there and tomorrow if you choose to join as well we hope you do uh we'll sort of roll into the upcoming election and really just sort of our existence being political um so let me tell you a little bit about um us here with Sama Sama. We originally started out as just sort of a monthly art show. It's kind of expanded to sort of cultivate further dialogue. Thank you. <laughs> you don't spark me Cheetos. Thank you. Uh, so I gotta keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but we, you know, our, our objective was to, what we realized was the, that we wanted to cultivate further dialogue um, on the narratives of the diaspora community. And so that's who we are now, and now we've had um, the space here to kind of do so. And we've partnered with the Sustainable Culture Lab for two events, last one being Diaspora Peoples Month, this one here being uh, the Alters Festival. And um, kind of bridging the philosophical work of the Sustainable Culture Lab and um, really bringing uh, the work of artists into sort of um, that that conversational space that is accessible for everybody. Uh, but you know, I'll let Bear take it from here so you can talk a little bit about SCL. Yeah, th thanks for the, the intro, Seda. And yeah, so at the Sustainable Culture Lab, we are quite philosophical and linguistic. But one thing that I've realized and that we've realized is that art plays a very vital role in articulating a lot of these complex ideas and so at sustainable culture lab one of the like one of the words and concepts that we we focus on a lot is this word ethnocide which it's the destruction of culture while keeping the people the word was was coined in 1944 by raphael lemkin alongside the word genocide and you know while genocide is a word that we're all quite familiar with it's revolutionized the globe 
um, and our awareness and our, our, our capacity to combat like widespread atrocities. Um, ethnocide is, is, is remained pretty dormant. And at SCL, we use this concept of, of the destruction of cultural keeping the people to articulate the transatlantic slave trade uh, because that was the objective of that was to get African people and extract their culture so there can be a cultureless mass of, of bodies that could be essentially be human machines for colonization and perpetuity. And then you would just build societies with this division and normalize it. And, you know, so it became cultural destruction, exploitation, um, just became a norm. And we didn't have really a language to articulate this. And we feel that ethnocide provides a really good framework for articulating that. But at the end of the day, we, we aren't here just to describe bad things and raise awareness to that, you know, how to articulate something that's bad. We need to create structures to empower people to create good things. And if you live in a, a place that normalizes the destruction of culture, you now have to start imagining ways to create culture. And, you know, when I became aware of Day of the Dead, this, a light bulb went off that this was a practice of sustaining culture. But due to the diversity of America, if people outside the Mexican American community can share their culture alongside Mexican Americans and bring in cultural traditions from their communities that are outside America and we can do it together, now we're actually embarking on this like really profound cultural creation endeavor where you know, three times, you know, three days out of the year, we can get African-Americans, Latinos, Asian-Americans, white Americans, uh, Americans of various religious beliefs all coming together to articulate their culture and share it. And as, you know, diverse, you know, there's a lot of, you know, interracial, intercultural marriages happening in the U.S. And so now that, that need to articulate shared culture under one roof is really, really uh, paramount. And so that's, that's an engagement of culture creation. So part of our work, in addition to articulating how you know, we, uh, our society has normalized the destroying of culture while keeping the people is to embark on things to create culture. And so like, I view this in a very like, philosophical, linguistic way. And you know, I can articulate it as, as such, but a key thing is art is essential because now people can see something they can feel it it can it can it can get them in their heart and not just in their head in the intellectual space and so partnering with sama sama and having them introduce us to so many great artists in dc and other parts of the us that the the intellectual uh, you know understanding of it really connects to them but also having them show their heart and, and, and their creativity to or express what an altar could look like to them, which then can inspire other people to make altars and not feel that they are appropriating somebody's culture to do so. I think a lot of the, the hesitation regarding shared culture experiences, especially regarding Day of the Dead, is that a lot of people feel that they have to copy that the Mexican tradition when they're not Mexican in order to do it properly. But that is in itself a, a manifestation of culture appropriation in many ways. And so if you could share your culture with Mexican Americans um, and not feel the need to appropriate or copy, now we're creating something new and we're learning about each other and we're creating something uh, really powerful. And so, you know, that's that's the goal of what we're doing here and I really uh, appreciate the partnership that we have with Sama Sama to provide the, the the heart the artistic the creative space in addition to what we provide which is a lot of you know clearly we all have a lot of heart and until and, and you know and we use our intelligence and all of this but you know art and works really well with philosophy and language to make people understand these uh, really impactful ideas yeah, and you know, um, just bringing that that point up about appropriation, and I think if we are 
you know, doing our part in, in having that conversation with one another in our own spaces where, you know, however you have chosen to re represent yourself from, you know, your, the Asian identity, the Black identity, the diaspora identity, the Indigenous identity, that we're all just as responsible for participating in that conversation about appropriation that isn't around this white-centered space, right? You know, we got to also um, take accountability of removing ourselves from constantly centering these conversations uh, from, from whiteness and, and decolonizing that work. And that's the reason why even doing this event, um, you know, we've had our own internal conversations as a team that's just saying, you know, what are, what is going to be the differences between appropriation and appreciation as well as, um, you know, taking in, you know, the things that we kind of need that these holidays and practices in which we honor ancestry and, and create rituals and um, practice these rituals that is healing for all of us that have that been have had that missing in, in our lives, whether you've been removed from um, from that practice due to sort of an intergenerational thing when you when you have parents like, like me that have emigrated to this country or um, in which, you know, sort of as a survival or just due to assimilation, you know, sometimes the parents kind of forget to pass on some of these holidays and traditions or, or if you're American where, you know, if somebody passes or you're thinking about grandma, the most you have ever actually taken that space was to attend a funeral. And, but, you know, have we formalized or created a formal um, communal um, gathering to really take that sacred space and you know it doesn't have to necessarily be religious it doesn't um, but really more of a spiritual um, space and uh, you know and if we had that in this country um, and again it's not to say that some of us don't already have these traditions right but I think when we're living in this country and you know it's not about stepping aside and you know all right well you know this holiday i know if you knew this but i do this but if we all had that understanding in this country too that that it's it's a real thing you know does that change the way that we value human life um and 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 that's one thing that you know i i know is really important for you, for you barrett when you created this altars documentary and and kind of adapted to learning about dia de los muertos and how that has kind of um evolved and grown into something bigger than that and the conversations about um you know again human life and and race and um just sort of uh, the culture here in this country and 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 how that connects to ethnocide so um you know that being said it just makes me go back to sort of uh, what we were talking about, the value of our artists, you know, participating in creating these altars, because while, you know, altars are a very intimate thing, um, intimate practice, um, however you choose to uh, create one, um, our artists have been really kind to um, sort of create and transform this thought um, about the concept of altars in a really nuanced way, whether it's political or just strictly uh, a personal healing and share that with us. And hopefully that kind of will connect with everybody. Um, and uh, just kind of rolling into the theme that we chose to highlight for today is sort of that intersectionality, right? And um, and I think that's, an, that's gonna touch on all of the altars that our artists have, have shared with us um, because that's just who we are as people now. You know, we're talking about a, a, a cultural indigenous practice or, you know, a, a native practice or traditions from another country that have long existed. So uh, even, even if we've taken space to um, learn about that, the roots and the foundation of where this has come from and how it's evolved um, and, and really kind of honoring that, there, there's still a piece of it that's going to have that intersection. And I think some for today is going to be more intentional than others in a way. Um, but you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, what I'm really also looking forward to mostly because it's something that I relate to. And I always really enjoy having those conversations about that because the reality is, you know, um, we're, we're, we're changing, you know, the, our, our context, our cultural and political context is always changing. And how does that affect who we are when we're sort of hanging on to an identity or seeking out learning more about 
um, that that identity. Um, however, it is that that means you know to, to each people. Yeah, just just to add on to that, like a a key thing when we are talking about culture is acknowledging that culture culture isn't static. It's always changing. It's always evolving. The key thing is making sure that when you that evolution, that change happens is that you're doing something that's constructive and not destructive. And I think and when we are in an ethnocidal space, we've normalized doing destructive things. Um, and then we find out down the road uh, that something that we, that we didn't handle it properly. It's, you know, I, the amount of conversations I've had with people about Day of the Dead, and there's a very genuine concern that if it becomes cross-cultural, it's gonna then become all right, it's Budweiser beer cans for everything. And now it's just a big party. And, you know, the altar doesn't have any meaning. It's like, you know, and it's just this thing to have an excuse to, you know, drink or do something. And, you know, I, you know, my, my feeling in many ways is that the, that regression might not have had a malicious intent at the beginning. It's just because we are in a society where people are accustomed to consuming culture uh, for profit and, and viewing that as a beneficial thing. And so this process right here is hopefully to change the discourse and change the philosophy um, where you perceive it differently and you articulate your actions just a little differently so that you can sustain and cultivate things opposed to be destructive. And having artists show their altars is really, really key because now it gives people a, va a way to visualize what their altar could look like where they feel like it's okay to make one that doesn't necessarily look like how uh, a traditional Dito Los Muertos altar would look like, or it doesn't look like this one or that one. It's, this is my genuine, authentic expression of an altar, and I feel comfortable with it. And, and artists provide a really great template for allowing us to, to see that and visualize it. And I'll say for myself at a personal level, like I'm not, I'm not a professional artist. And so seeing the artists that we've brought in, see the, seeing their work has helped me visualize what I would like mine to look like, you know, now and in the years to, you know, years to come. And so it's, it's really important. Great. Well, um, so we're going to probably start get, to, get going and um, with the artists talks. And if you all have any questions or comments, please, um, put them in the chat. Uh, we look forward to kind of hearing everybody's thoughts and, um, you know, just engage and, and talk to us and we'll, we'll share everything. Also, if you're participating today, you'll receive a follow-up link of, of the information of everybody. Um, but let me know if you are ready, unless, if not, it is okay. You are? Did I get a nod from you? <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking through the, the catalog of faces here. <laughs> So let me just give you a little introduction. We're so happy that you're here today. I know that you, everybody here has been taking some space to join us, so we appreciate you all. Um, Almas Hade is a storyteller whose current work offers liberatory interpretations of Islamic texts and rituals. Through creative acts, she seeks to visualize, visualize, honor, and ancestralize women, queer, and gender expansive beings often using speculative fiction as a grounding mechanism. In addition to her artistic practice, Almas is an activist supporting the existence and just alignment of South Asian and queer and trans Muslim collectives in the fight for BIPOC liberation. She recently returned to academia to reclaim ancestral design technologies via a master's in architecture. That's beautiful. <laughs> But I'll go ahead. You got your screen share. Thank you so much. Take yeah. it off. Thank you um, thanks so much to everyone for inviting me into this community. Again, my name is Almas Heather, and the last several weeks have just been such an expansive experience for me. Um, I feel like I've, it's the first opportunity I've had, despite like all this work that I've done and um, related to a recent adornment practice that I've been creating a lot more jewelry as well as a lot more collages like the one you see here where I've been exploring this like idea of the Kaaba uh, which is the holy site of pilgrimage in Islam um, as a place 
that can be used for space and time travel, which is something that I feel very deeply in my heart that that is a technology and use of that space. But um, I really question generally, you know, like the use of um, sites of power today. And, uh, you know, as like the student of architecture um, and going into this program as well with the specific purpose of reclaiming technologies to support black land reparation, to build out BIPOC land projects, um, and to really reconnect with these ancestral sites of power and these techniques that we had of building um, that we may not necessarily understand fully um, what the uses of these sites are, but I hope that this altar um, offers a sense of grounding to build your intuitive practice, which is something someone, multiple people mentioned yesterday as well. Like I feel intuition and embodiment practices are so important for us um, as BIPOC people to be able to receive the messages of our benevolent ancestors um, and to create, you know, just to create justly in this world. And so I wanted to offer these images as a grounding for my background that I come from and informs the base of this altar. So I was raised in a Shia Pakistani uh, Muslim community and we grew up uh, creating altars around um, this battle of Karbala. It took place on the 10th day of Muharram, which is the first month in the Muslim calendar. And the invitation, like the email to create and be a part of this project arrived right in the middle of this um, very important time for my sect. And so I took it to be very auspicious and uh, not taking it lightly, right? And um, I come from this tradition with my mother taught me growing up um, that, you know, our sect is small. We used to meet in different people's homes until uh, people had the funds to create like masjids um, dedicated for our sect because we are a minority um, and we create these altars to commemorate the story of this battle where um, 72 men and women were um, in this uh, fight against a politically corrupt and unjust regime and out of this battle only one person survived and um, sorry only one man survived who is the great grandson of the prophet Muhammad, as well as the women. And the way this story survives is because these women who were paraded in chains throughout the kingdom went to every single city and shared this story. And um, this practice developed from it of creating miniatures of this battle. Like we have a cradle that we see here in a shrine um, a horse, these, rep these are emblematic of people and ballads that are sung during, these, uh, during this commemorative ceremony. And it's not something that's just unique to Pakistan, um, but it's also like my wife and I went to Trinidad and Tobago for our honeymoon, and this photo on the right is a photo of their Muharram, their Ashura um, commemorations, which um, like ours, have this component of having a shrine within your masjid, as well as um, a parade, essentially, that happens in the street with these giant floats that are created and are full of um, these, again, these emblematic pieces that connect you to a very specific time and place, um, as well as these um, hands that you see. And those carry the names of specific honor and never forget. So when I created my piece, I wanted to consider what is that site I want to connect to that I feel the strong connection to. And as you see in that first photo, it's that um, piece that connects to the Kaaba that I mentioned, this black box in the middle of Mecca, Saudi Arabia. And it's something that predates Islam. It's connected to the solstices and equinox um, it has this strong connection to the harvest moon, which was two weeks after, you know, the invite to uh, be a part of the altars project, which is when I decided to um, start cleansing all the materials that I would use for my altar. And that included creating a ritual bath, 
um, as well as uh, using this the fabric that you see here, this Jainamaz prayer rug as a base to hold um, the different components that I thought could be a part of the altar. And then I started the creation process. I chose a jewelry box that I got at Value Village, which is a local thrift chain here in DC. And um, I essentially took it apart. And um, it's something that I felt connected to. If I could have, I would have chosen a huge cabinet and built a garden inside of it. But I limited myself to a jewelry box, um, which is something that my uh, parents have grown up, people in my community have grown up having closets that they have their altars in. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then I use my laser cutter at school to create these, um, the alums, which is that component of the flags, the hands, and includes of women and gender and expansive beings whose messages I wanted to receive and you know, hope to receive, continue to receive through this altar. And that includes the names of Hajar and Mariam, which are the largest hands you see that I've created out of clay in that last, um, that last image on the right. And I'll share their connection Gaba in a second, um, as well as carnelian stones, as well as moonstone and selenite and shungite that are included in this altar. Um, because we, Arab, I'm not Arab, but um, Islamic Arab, uh, what am I trying to say? So Islam still carries with it a lot of traditions that are pagan, including the pilgrimage site um, and the rituals related to the pilgrimage, um, as well as uh, these acts of like importance of crystals and stones within our worship. So a peak, which is carnelian, um, is very important to Muslims, as is turquoise, um, rubies, um, the Najaf, which is a ring I'm wearing here. Uh, so we definitely come from this tradition of being connected to stones, and that became a component of the altar as well. Um, oh dear, my slides froze. Oh, here we go. So here's the first look at the altar in all its finery. So it includes these, um, the alums that I've built out and a bowl of water to offer as a grounding as well as smoke cleansing to offer as a grounding. And then it shows um, these two mountains of selenite that reference Safa and Marwa, which were sites of worship to the goddesses Manat, Lat, and Uzza, um, as well as the Kaaba, a black shungite in the center. Uh, all references to the site of the Kaaba um, that I'm hoping to create a portal to that it doesn't require physical, um, a physical like pilgrimage. You know, I want to be able to go to the site that's similar to the Battle of Karbala holds um, a lot of contentious relationship to um, power, and there's a lot of unjust, corrupt, uh, just inhumane acts that are happening in the place, the government that controls access to the site. So I don't necessarily want to give my money to these people, but I will be, I will create a portal. And this is what I'm doing here to be able to access this um, important ancestral knowledge. And, um, you know, the images of Hajar and Mariam, which are Hagar and Mary in, um, I guess, Christian text, uh, they both hold significance in different ways to this pilgrimage site as well, and I'm a little worried that I'm running out of time, so I'm just like breezing through these images now. You're, um, not, you're, you're perfect. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like these women and unnamed people that I have um, carnelian holding uh, spaces for them in this altar, um, there's so much unknown history within Islamic texts, rituals, and mythology. I feel like it's not alone in our sect or any like uh, spiritual faith. You know, there are just things that we don't know and may never know or have access to because of, um, I don't know, patriarchy and misogyny and uh, just power, you know, like this excessive, disgusting, like desire to have power that limits our knowledge and access to knowledge. But there's this intuition that we can uh, build. And uh, Mariam was one of the women whose pre-Islamic um, 
this predates Islam, but the Kaaba, which has been a site of worship and pilgrimage for these three goddesses, has also held the names of um, 365. It was supposed to be one uh, name of a god or deity for every day of the solar calendar. And Mary was one of the names that was included in this uh, site. And Hagar Hajar was also another person who, um, like the whole entire Islamic interpretation of what Hajj is, um, is because of her and being abandoned by Abraham in the desert and running back and forth between these two mountains until she found a well of water to, um, you know, give water to her son and find a settlement and grow a whole entire community that became what it is today. Um, so these are just like what we know based from what we were told, what I was taught. Um, and I don't think that's the whole story. I don't think that it was just um, Mary, you know, being locked in a box underneath someone's home and then miraculously gave birth. Hager, Hager wasn't just abandoned in the desert to give birth to a new nation. You know, it's, I think that there's a lot more. Um, and I invite that from these beings, these ancestralized benevolent beings um, to share that with me and to help inform my own practice and my community's practice going forward. So I'm gonna stop there, I've talked a lot. I welcome any questions. Um, really love talking about this and welcome talking more about it. Thank you. Thank you. That was so, that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful altar. I mean, the colors and everything that you spoke about was just really something to think about. We do have one comment here from, is it, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Aisha? She said, yeah, I'm sorry. Is that, is, oh, there is. Um, she says, I'm confused because I thought Prophet Abraham, Abraham built the Kaaba. Yeah, and I think that's, um, that's a very interesting narrative that we get told of how Islam, um, you know, like how do we Islamicize the site that predated Islam and the act of sacrificing an animal at this um, pilgrimage site was something that was done for the goddess Manath. Shaving your head was something that was done for Manath. Um, the Kaaba's foundation and like the existence and worship of this site has long predated it as long as well as like the worship and connection to the black stone, which is ha isn't something that I've gone into, um, which some say is a meteorite that fell from Venus and is embedded into the eastern corner of the Kaaba that we go visit and kiss, everyone wants to kiss it. You know, there's, there, there is, an, if you take it from the perspective that I have taken it, it's something that um, I think is a real, it says something that it's a really powerful technology that both goddess worship within this region as well as Islam connected to that site. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, which, which history is true. I'm just stating some facts of like, this was an important site to multiple people of multiple spiritual um, communities. But thank you, Aisha, I'm so glad you're here. I have a, another question. What is the significance of the color orange? And yeah, I mean, I see it not, not even just in your altar, but a lot of um, altars as well as traditions across, you know, international and global uh, spaces that, or the color orange is a significant one that, you know, I've never really looked into why, maybe you probably know why, because, you know, I think about monks robes, at least for us, you know, are always, are orange. But yes, what is the significance of the color orange? Yeah, so actually, interestingly enough, um, marigolds are not used within at least Pakistani Islamic communities. It's something that is associated with Hinduism and for that reason is intentionally never used. But, and you know, we're taught more, I was always taught to use jasmine flowers and roses. Um, today I have some dried rose petals from my ancestor altar as the base. Um, and my intention for this altar is it to be dressed 
like I think adornment and the practice of adornment is so important. Like everything you see in the altar is earrings also. Um, and I've worn those earrings of Hajar and Miriam for the podcast recording for SCL, uh, which you know you didn't see, but now you know. You can imagine that <laughs> while you're listening. Um, but I chose marigolds with that intent because it it was something where I wanted to, you know, just speak about how like even flowers have been politicized and you know, just a, associated with a faith that you're supposed to have antagonism towards. It's just, it's so odd um, to me. And um, I was offered these marigolds from this person in Kenya um, who runs um, a communal garden in Baltimore called Park and Place, part of Park and Place Foundation. I'm butchering the name, I'm going to put it in the chat. But anyway, I wanted to honor like that relationship with this person and the work that they're putting into creating this garden, and the full intent that she has in curating the space. So I felt like it was such um, a, a gift that was in alignment with creating this altar. And I didn't want to think so much about like, what is the right flower to include in this spell? Because I just wanted to trust the intuitive process there. Yeah, I mean, just you say that that once that makes me bring up something about just the significance of why, you know, we want to kind of create the space about the intersectionality of these um, altars and, and how we relate to it and just sort of challenging and questioning some of these um, um, these, these symbols and the way the altars are made as well as some of the practices that went along with it. And I think, you know, I think it's a safe space for us to, to take the, to take a moment to challenge it. You know, I mean, sometimes we're kind of perpetuating a lot of these, uh, um, you know, traditions and thoughts and values that we're connected to that we don't 100% feel connected to. And I think that is sort of an issue is why some of these rituals, some of these rituals are lost along the way generationally because times, you know, we've evolved, our culture has evolved. We've, you know, through migration, immigration, like through travel, like we've uh, sort of found ourselves in different ways. And, um, you know, but, you know, part of us still wants to remain connected to, to our heritage and our identity, but, you know, we feel like in itself, we're either supposed to accept all of it or accept none of it. And, and like as, as somebody who, you know, when I go to the temple and, and what I choose to practice at home and how I choose to pass that on to my children, like I, I'm, I'm definitely at a point now in my life, I need to figure out what it is that I want to take away. And if I'm okay with that and allowing my space, myself to say, I'm okay with letting some of this go because it is quite problematic and, and that it also is okay to challenge it, whether or not my mom agrees with, with me. Oh, but, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I think I told yeah, we have, we're, we're yeah. talking about respecting them, right? Like that's the whole point. It's like, no, I'm doing it because I respect you and I want to take so that this along with me but yes please you know yeah I mean I feel like my mom had a similar response to your mother where she was just like wow this is hella disrespectful and I was like I don't think it is but I can hear you and I can hold that you're having this reaction because you feel like I didn't um, get the understanding that you hoped I would get by raising me and I feel like really she raised me like in as a child like being taught to cleanse the altar space, to adorn it with flowers, to carry the alums um, as we did our parades. And these are, you know, English words for them. So it feels really odd to say I'm parading around with something that's like so deeply spiritual and important. Um, but yeah, like I feel like she may not know it, but the reason why I have such an expansive relationship to my faith I was raised with is because I feel like I saw so much um, that, I don't know, I just, I think that there's so much more that we can learn from this practice, that it doesn't have to be static. None of this has to be static. It can grow with our own understanding of the world as we live through it and move through it. Yeah, I'd just like to add a little piece on this because everything you guys are saying makes just perfect sense. I, strangely, I've, find that you got it from Value Village to be like one of the most like incredible parts of it because we live in a society that 
tries to place value on stuff being expensive and not mm -hmm. not intentionality or the, the spirit behind your actions. Like if it costs a lot of money, then it's a good thing. And now you look at it. So to see such a, a, a beautiful altar come from something that, you know, American society would disregard and probably be like, that's a piece of junk. You know, that doesn't have any value. You got it from Value Village. You should have gone to, you, should, you know, you should have gone to Pier or whatever or something. So one of these fancy stores with furniture. And so I just think that's uh, like really, you know, like quietly significant. Like, you know, we're having a very profound conversation where we're challenging uh, various like religious traditions and modifying it to, you know, ad uh, adapt to the adapting of our society. And like, you know, we, we move to another part of the world and we, we interact with these different types of people and their beliefs and now it's merging and it's all like merging together into something harmonious that even if like your mom doesn't totally agree with it, she knows that it's not some flippant thing that you're doing. It's, it's something that has a lot of intention and even if they disagree, they kind of have to respect it, even if they don't want to say it out loud, because they know that their kid or their child is, is, is putting a lot of intention and thought behind it. And so to have all of that packaged within a, like a beautiful uh, container that in American discourse, we wouldn't even attach value to it, I think is really, really um, cool. And so, you know, uh, so I, I, I enjoyed all of it. Yeah, I mean, I think in a time like this, um, especially from, I mean, I mean, just the social political space that we're in and the generation that are, is extremely vocal and um, uh, uh, like, how are we, um, it's, it's, it's hard to say because it just, it just makes me think of like, how do we, it, it's that thought of picking and choosing. And, and, and I think when it comes into a spiritual space, the picking and choosing is a whole other thing. There's like the picking and choosing that you choose to be socially active in, right? When we're talking about just political movements, activism. And when it comes to actual like traditions and, and, and you know, our parents' um, cultural spaces, where do we pick and choose when we're also ingrained with this level of respect and disrespect? You know, it's so black and white. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes that's a little bit more difficult than, you know, a political space is saying, well, you know, I'm in conservative in these ideals and I'm definitely more liberal in, in, in these ideals. And, you know, that's different and it's much more accepted and it's almost easier to sort of take on and, and you know, find solutions for in, in, in that way. You know, how we choose to vote, how we choose to engage with our, with our friends and our peers. But when it comes to, um, you know, something as close to this, uh, I think it's rarely talk, talked about. So I'm, I'm, I mean, it makes me feel relieved and happy that we're all here to kind of um, give space to that because typically in a conversation when it comes to religious um, practices, to me, it's just listening to what my mom says, even though I have a pretty good understanding of what she wants me to do, what I choose to do and what I have to do when I'm around with her. Um, but at some point, you know, the reality is she won't be here that much longer and now I'm really left to go well this holiday came around is this one that I'm going to choose to kind of carry on um and and then god I forgot what it is that thing that she made me do but she's not here to remind me anymore when I just took that for granted and and now's the time for us to kind of find out what it is um that we want to carry on yeah I, to to add I to add on to that I like part of this work for me has been that realization of since America's ethnocidal, I think each generation almost feels tasked with figuring out what to teach the generation that will come after them. There's not like, there's not a continuous narrative of what my parents taught me. That's the thing that I'm definitely gonna teach my kids because I know it'll work. It's there, the culture gets consumed and there's not a narrative of creating like a new type of culture as new people show up and we make something new there's not that narrative and so i think at at certain stages in our lives we all have that question of like i'm going to end up becoming responsible for something very young and i'm going to need to be able to tell that 
new person things to make them a good person. And then you have that frightening realization of, I'm not sure if I know what that is, and I'm not even sure how much I can rely on my parents to add this uh, to it. And so like part of the Sustainable Culture Lab and even articulating it as a laboratory is, is realizing that there is this, this mixture of people and we have to, it evolves. And I think with Day of the Dead or this practice, the realization that you get to make an altar the next year means that I did it this year and this is my interpretation. And maybe I learned something from another artist or another person's altar, or I had a new person enter into my space and now my altar next year will incorporate this new amount of information and this new. And so the fact that it's like set on the calendar and it, it, it means that evolution and growth is, is inherently a part of it is, um, I think, really, really significant. And so, but yeah, we all are encountering that dilemma of what do we pass on and how stable is that and what, what, what are the roots? And I think this practice really helps us kind of start thinking really like with a lot of intention about what that is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Oh, go ahead. Well, just to say, speak to that, um, that growth process of what do we pass on? I think something that I touched upon in the podcast was that when I started this process, I was like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to specifically connect it to the divine feminine in Islam. That's what I was trying to put out there. And as I was doing it, I was just like, wow, what a like, like gender construct to impose on spirituality like where did I come from why am I doing this you know why do I need to bring that into this uh space and how does that limit then what I'm able to receive from it so I think that it's not just like um it's just like to go back to like what I said of round there's this continual process of growth and I hope that we can shed like it speaks to like the shedding that we need to do ourselves and um, take ownership of that shedding as well and that be um, a self-reflective like skill that we pass on along with these traditions right like and continue to question them continue to ask yourself like is this in alignment with the world that we are trying to create as we get more clearer understanding of what that world is if that makes sense mm -hmm. Um, so Sarah also said some um, mentioned about how we're learning a lot about our ancestral practices through the internet, and that was something too that uh, at its root, a lot of the rituals and you know where it started was obviously not in a time of internet. You know, it's very connected with nature. It's very connected with just oral traditions and you know, how does that play into the changes of some of these ancestral practices? Um, but that's, that's a very good point to, to bring up. So um, before we move on, we do have, um, I, is it Aisha? She really wanted to say something. Um, so if you all are cool, you can say something for uh, really quickly before we move on. If you want to request to unmute. No, oh, no, let's, yep. Oh, she cannot unmute. Let's find her. Oh, there she is. Okay. I thought I just unmuted her. Okay, okay. Got I got it, yeah. Um, I think speaking to that, like, like how like it's not really expected for us to like create new culture. Um, I think the big reason for that is because of like capitalism is because like it's only profitable to make new culture if you can make money off of it. So if you can't make money, and it's not profitable. I mean, obviously it's a little bit more complicated than that, but I think that, that that's important to state. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with a lot of that. I, America's capitalism, how, how capitalism gets used a lot, in many ways you, you're encouraged to profit off of the exploitation of other people. Um, and that's inherently problematic. It's, it's really funny if you look at uh, Marxist interpretation of capitalism, capitalism is just tracking the flow of money and movement. And that isn't anything inherently negative about money moving so that people can buy 
things that they need. It becomes problematic when you, when you don't regulate it and you allow for people to be exploited and money to be exchanged to harm people, where now you have a very destructive system. And American capitalism was based around profiting off of ethnocide, where we're going to destroy the culture of African people and make them work forever so that a colonizing force can you know, potentially make money off of them forever. That is, no matter what the concept is, if that's your foundation, you're gonna have so many problems creating a, a, a good society for people to live in. And I think we still grapple with that today and it's hard to grapple with it when we don't have a language to articulate what that core problem is. And it's essentially the destruction of culture for money. And now we need to start imagining and creating ways to create culture, create, and the fact that America is so big, like it's the size of a continent. We have over 300 million people and those people come from so many different places where now it's a very intricate puzzle about figuring out how to stay, how to create that equitable shared culture with all these different voices over this massive amount of area. But that's where we need to start thinking. Um, and if we think that way, we'll actually be able to track the flow of money in a way where that capital isn't being used at the expense of others. It'll be used to benefit other people. And straight, frankly, that's a lot of what Marx's work was all about, which is kind of funny. No one really guards him as someone that knows a lot about capitalism, but his book is, you know, Das Kapital. <laughs> so, but no, great question. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Amas. Um, if we're going to try really hard to try to get to everybody's question, if, if time permits, and you know, sometimes we have a little bit more time, sometimes we don't. Um, but if we have some time toward the end, we'll try to highlight it. And, and I'm sure all of our artists are, are willing to be open to your questions that so you can direct message um, them as well if we don't get to it. Um, to throw you all out there. <laughs> Contact them directly. Uh, so I'm actually going to share my screen um, as we introduce our, our next uh, artist, Matt Manalo. And I always get really anxious sharing my screen because you just never know, is it going to work? So I'm going to do it quickly. We're going to show a little bit of clip and then get going. Wish me luck. <laughs> Let's thumbs, thumbs up that you see. And thumbs up when you hear. Hi, my name is Matt Manalo. I am an artist and a community organizer based in Houston, Texas. Being a first generation immigrant, I discuss my experiences navigating around the physical and social structures of society through my work. For the Alter Festival, we were asked to reflect on the idea of the tradition of altar making in different cultures and how it plays into a society where its history constantly practices ethnocide. Being raised Catholic, I've always been surrounded by altars from home to school to basically almost anywhere I went to growing up in Belgium. Because my wife is Mexican, I want to incorporate some of her culture's influences which we have been practicing at home, especially during Dia de los Muertos. The material I'm using for my altar is a mylar blanket. I've put them together to make a large blanket, which will cover a 20 foot shipping container. The shipping container is also located in the neighborhood of a -Leaf, which is considered the most diverse district in Houston, Texas. By doing this, I want the shipping container to symbolize the body which is also a space, but because of what is going on in the south of the borders of Texas and California, I want to discuss the separation of families and deaths of immigrants. Myler is also highly reflective, so I want the viewer to see their own reflection on the altar and see how they are also affected by it. Thank you. 
that was beautiful. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> oh, you don't understand. I was sweating. I was like, oh my God, it's like 30 seconds left. Um, thank you, Antonio Hernandez, um, Electric Llama Indelibles for, for that, that video. Um, but uh, let me actually let's go ahead. So Mr. Manal is an artist and community organizer. He creates work that involves elements of painting, drawing, sculpture, photography, and printmaking. Being a first generation immigrant, Manal discusses his experiences navigating around the physical and social structures of society through his work. As he explores this, home becomes a two-part environment where the artist is split between the Philippines and Texas. It is important to mention that colonization of the Philippines by Spain, Japan, and the United States resulted in erasure, colorism, and colonial mentality, a frequent topic in Manal's work. Manal is a founder of Filipina Ex Artists of Houston, a collective of visual, performing, literary, culinary, and multidisciplinary artists, and he runs an alternative art space called the Aleph Art House. Thank you. Always nice reminder. Every time I read these files, I'm like, man, everybody's so interesting and exciting. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And um, I know we only saw sort of like a bit of, of, you know, what you created over there. And as everybody knows, he's actually tuning in live from Texas. <laughs> um, so please tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your process, your altar and, and your thought behind it. Well, you know, um, I am an artist. Um, who uses a lot of materials, you know, in my work. Uh, you can see some of it behind me. I'm in my studio right now in Houston. Um, so I wanted to also incorporate like that whole um, kind of artistic process of putting materials together and thinking about their function and their aesthetic and how they would kind of like express the message that I wanted to to give for this uh, project with the altars. Um, you know, uh, like what I said in the video, you know, I was born, uh, well, not born, but I was raised Catholic. Um, uh, earlier, you know, I was with my family and I, and we, we went to the cemetery with my, with my parents, and I was, we were there praying the rosary for my grandparents. Um, and, um, you know, it's a tradition that we've been having ever since I was a kid. Um, and, and now that we immigrated here in the US, we try to still keep the tradition alive. Um, and then when I got married, um, I was introduced to the altar making uh, for Dia de los Muertos uh, because my wife is Mexican. Um, and I was, kind of like really surprised at how or how deep and how they celebrated the Day of the Dead compared to how Filipinos did because for us it was more about the death and being sad you know being quiet not being happy during the Day of the Dead you know but for Mexicans it was the complete opposite um, and, and also accepting that death was part of life um, and because of the reality that I live being an immigrant and also living in Houston, Texas, um, you know, I'm not very far away from the camps, uh, down South. Um, and also having conversations with my family and, you know, especially with my parents and what pro-life is and all that. I believe that, you know, being pro-life should be more than just being anti-abortion. Um, you know, there are so many other things that needs to be discussed of how pro-life should be. Like being pro-life is, you know, to be also for Black Lives Matter, you know, and also for, um, for families to be together and not being separated. Um, and just the whole idea, also being a parent, just the whole idea of having children separated in the border just really 
you know, breaks my heart. And, and to think that these folks who dream that they are pro-life aren't really supporting or defending the children, um, you know, uh, or even trying to get them back um, to their parents, you know, just the whole idea of being separated from my kids alone is already a very scary thought for myself. Um, so I also believe that the body is a space and because I run an art space, there's a lot of life that goes in that space, especially with art. Um, just the whole definition of like how art um, reflects life. Um, so the heart, of, the heart of the shipping container already brings a lot of life and, and, and I wanted to kind of like use that, um, that idea to make it parallel to like the human body. And for this case, you know, the body of a child um, being separated from their families um, in the border. And the only thing that's covering them from the cold floors or, or air conditioning is, is the Mylar blanket. Um, and then also kind of like borrowing the whole idea of Cristo covering different things, monuments, buildings, um, because I'm Catholic and I kind of like want to make that, make that pun, you know, uh, with Cristo and Jesus Christ and, you know, covering the, um, the altar with like a mylar blanket. Um, <clears throat> and then um, the mylar also being reflective, I wanted the altar to be um, kind of like a pro uh, an object where we can see ourselves in as well and reflect on our beliefs or what we think is right or wrong or think about death or think about the families, or think about the children being separated. Um, <clears throat> and also like with the whole, um, I don't know if you got a glimpse of, of the other materials that was used, but there are rocks in the bottom and then there's uh, water bottles, gallon uh, water bottles. And then on top of the gallon water bottles, um, there's a, a marigold plant with flowers. Um, so, you know, being an immigrant and being from the Philippines, I always say that, you know, um, it's not really walls that serve as my border. Um, I came here, you know, through an airplane, so it's the sky and the sea. So my work always deals a lot with water and how those are the natural borders that separate me from my home. Um, <laughs> and so being the plant, living off of water, but then it's not giving access um, because the water is trapped in the water bottle. Um, it needs like, you know, human interaction for it to be able to get that nourishment. It's kind of like the same idea that um, if we don't care as a community, you know, for, for the folks who need it, then obviously uh, there will be death. Um, and those are one of, you know, those are the few things that I wanted to talk about with, with the altar. Also made it monumental. Um, you know, it could be seen, it was seen through the streets. It was already taken down um, because we had to install a new mural at the space. Um, <clears throat> But for the time being that it was up, you know, a lot of cars were passing by and they were able to see uh, a very reflective surface um, that was definitely, you know, eye-catching. And then the location of this, uh, of the altar um, is also in A-Leaf. It's in the, in, in the grounds of where the A-Leaf uh, art house is because A-Leaf is, considered as the most diverse uh, neighborhood in Houston. Um, and I wanted to make that 
um, message out there that even though we are the most diverse, sometimes we are also, you know, the most racist. Um, and I wanted to like, you know, bring in those discussions through my altar. Yeah, so, yeah. that's, that's, yeah, it's to, to that point too, you know, and that's kind of why I said like, we're, we're uh, kind of decentralizing the white conversation about this, right? We're, we're here, whether, whether anybody here is attending, you know, is from a white space, it's, it's fine, you know, that's not the point, but the point is like, we're here to also challenge our own thoughts about it. Like you said, sometimes even, um, you know, our non-whites can be our, our racists um, in their own way. And it's kind of breaking that own cycle and taking accountability for you know how we perpetuate that in the, in this country as well in that conversation. What do you, what I really do appreciate about your altar too is that you're taking um, space to have a conversation about present life and not just past life, which is unique in that sense. Um, and and that's kind of what we are saying about the significance of altars is that it's about. Um, you know, if, if we have this practice and if we, you know, take this ritual on, you know, how does that change in the way that we value human life and that existing present life? So, yeah, I, I just want to add on to that real quick, because one of the first things I thought about when I experienced Day of the Dead was how in the African-American community, we'll make altars a lot in response to something tragic. If someone get shot or some, you know, Black Lives Matter, there'd be a lot of altars that were made for Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, all the faces we still make it today. And, I, you know, those are necessary. But a key thing that I thought about is if our practice is to make altars after something tragic happens, we're now just creating them as a way to like cope with inevitable tragedy, but not something that's proactive, that, exist before the tragic event where like that actually ends up like shifting the dynamic and so for me with regards to you know communities of color i always i kind of always saw altar creation as like a kind of like a peaceful kind of activism where this is a a, a, a space that you're creating a safe space a shared space that in many ways america hasn't created the space for that conversation to exist and so it's going to be in some fashion a provocation and mm -hmm. so you know even if your altar is just to tell the narrative of your life as a person of color and it has it's not intended to provoke the fact that it's in this space and that we've made this space and we're doing it prior to something tragic happen but a reminder of our existence and that can incorporate tragedy now that's a provocation and then there's also the next step where you could also make your altar with parts in it that you know are going to provoke and i thought i thought that was really fascinating with your altar where there was a it was intended to provoke and of like a a, a very it could say almost a peaceful way to provoke people into seeing a new space and that's that's the you know that's a key component because if, if you start looking at history the amount of communal spaces for people of color that were just broken up disbanded you can't gather here you have to go someplace else you know it's if well a lot of my work i end up talking about how after or during reconstruction they made all these black codes where it, they just made it illegal essentially to be a black person in the South. And if you were basically outside your house and not working for a white person, you could be, a, you could be labeled as a vagrant and then get arrested for vagrancy. And you know stuff like that was to prevent black people from gathering or not being able to live in a way where they just weren't living to work for white people. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I just I just wanted to add that where there is a this is a a peaceful provocation in many ways. Um, oh, that's an interesting idea about uh, 
that Joan brought up about the the complexity of the mylar blanket work in these shelters, not shelters, you know, these detention centers, that's all these kids are being given to survive, which is just dystopian, to be honest. But at the same time, you know, the, the blanket wasn't intent created for the intended purpose of being, you know, a dystopian blanket. It was created to hopefully provide warmth for people in some capacity. And so it's I think it's a you know, if you if you live in a place that does ethnocidal things, you can you can very easily get something that was intended for good and use it to perpetuate bad stuff. And I think uh, the Mylar blanket is one of those examples. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've tried it. Uh, it doesn't work, <laughs> at least for me, you know. Um, I don't know, like, it's a it's it's such a lame excuse to show that you're giving care to people that needs it. I, there's no, there shouldn't be any debate as to whether that is adequate. <laughs> if, if there is, that's a, that's a whole nother problem. But no, I, I, uh, I appreciated your altar. It's, I will say we've, we've seen in a couple of days about like five to six altars and none of them are even remotely similar which is really fascinating for me because if you have like for me it's it's a case of you see people you have an idea and you, you plant it in someone's head and you say if they like it let's see how it manifests and to see how it manifests so differently while still being authentic and you know as genuine as the next is really really exciting and so this was the, the first large scale one where cars could see as they drove by. Uh, and that was also slightly, you know, provocative. And so uh, I, yeah. I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, like they say, you know, you got, you got to make the fight irresistible, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Got to make the fight irresistible. Yeah, wow. and I'm really appreciating that because, and, and that's kind of the intention of the Altars Festival, right? Like it's, and that's why we've kind of created different days and, to and topics about this to kind of uh, have that space of appreciation and as well as those spaces to kind of be able to contradict um, and and question um, some of like the symbols of, of, of um, our surroundings by creating the altar, right? Like the altars wasn't intentionally meant to say, this is the only way to do it. You know, what does this mean to you when, when somebody presents this thought and this concept to you? Um, but you know, and, and one thing I wanted to ask you about, and, and something that is 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 a, a theme in a lot of your work, Matt, when you talk about colonization, and um, the idea of ethnocide, how that is tied in when you have a culture that is in that is inherently tied to colonization or ethnocide, right? And and what what was your space in that as you kind of you have like uh, your your wife's traditions of Dia de los Muertos. Um, and then you you talk a lot about um, your Filipino culture and um, the colonization there. And, you know, for me, it, it, it always, I, I like to kind of think a little bit of how it connects to me and when I think about Cambodian culture in the time of French colonization. And sometimes there was a sense of pride in that, right? So some of the things that are just ingrained in the everyday, in the buildings, in the environment, is due to colonization, which is, um, you know, very contradictory um, when it, when it comes to the space of pride as well as you know this was kind of imposed. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that when um, you're kind of you're approaching your work and and altars? Um, well, you know, like um, I think you know when I think about ethnocide and and colonization one thing and, and trying to connect that with the whole culture that's being sold here in the United States is, you know, the whole idea of hyper individualism and how, you know, and how that's, we're slowly, I mean, I've, I've, I'm slowly seeing articles being written about it and 
you know, recent ones um, and how it's just not the thing to do if you want to have like a healthy, safe space. Um, and, and trying to protest against that is by creating a space for the community and how, um, and how, you know, for, for Filipinos, we have this term called bayanihan, which is basically working as a community. It's the whole idea of like moving someone's house uh, to another neighborhood, but then you're carrying, you're lifting up the house on, on each other's back uh, and walking the house, you know, to a new location, basically. So like that whole idea of being against that culture of individualism I think is like the biggest um, for me like in how I process it and how I want to um, put it out there uh, you know that that um, I, I can make my own work as an individual, but then if I if I also make work along with other folks and with the community, then then it builds a better way of uh, a better space in in making that culture and in in doing things together and discovering. Um, ways of decolonize, decolonizing you know our thoughts or our language um you know even architecture like what you were saying earlier say, say to, that it was kind of like forced on us and that's kind of like sometimes like that's architecture as well like we we grow up and seeing these spaces that were um roots of, of colonization that we've, you know, we've come to love as colonized people um, and are, you know, being taken down. It's almost like these monuments that we're seeing uh, being taken down and then people are protesting about it, saying that it's, it's against history or against, you know, the heritage or something like that. But then if you really look into it, you're just going back to what those monuments were really made for, you know, um, and, you know, part of ethnocide is also gentrification where, you know, you see these apartments, these high rises, and, and then later on, they kind of like become these monuments of, of colonization as well. Um, by displacing the original folks that has you know, that's been there. Yeah. So one thing I just wanted to add on to that is you you mentioned um, the word bayanihan, and at SCL we have a newsletter called the Word, and we try to we send a word of the week uh, to try to like enlighten people each week, and one of our words was bayanihan. Uh, because, you know, to counter ethnocide, you need to start having a language for community. Like, I, th I definitely think individualism, this American idea is, is based on the fracturing of community, where like now if the community is shattered, you can exist as an individual and think that that's the way to do it. In many ways, you exist as an individual at the expense of other individuals. Um, and so to start shifting that understanding, you have to start injecting new words. And fortunately, a lot of other societies have plenty of words to articulate that and they get lost in translation in the US a lot. They kind of fall out of usage. And so uh, we had Bayanihan and another one we had a couple weeks ago was uh, this Japanese one from Okinawa called uh, Moai, which is like a group of friends that people have forever and in Okinawa, you know, people that have this, uh, this moai, they live longer and have healthier lives because they have like a group of, you know, four to five friends that are like lifelong partners that are there forever. Like they, they know the, the, the members of this longer than they know their spouses. 
Um, and so these are just concepts that, um, that we can um, embrace as we kind of go forward. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I, th I think one of the peculiar things is when you learn about ethnocide, you see how it manifests in so many facets of American life that you, we've been thinking about them as being dissimilar or like, you know, their own siloed thing, but actually they speak to a whole cultural foundation. And now to counter it, you have to create new culture, but in that incorporates the language to articulate what that culture is and what it values and also the art to manifest it and, uh, and, and everything. But I think, I think with that, Matt, I think we're going to go to the next artist and, and Seda, Want me to do, want me to introduce some D, DC scores? Or? Yeah, you introduce the the you know individuals. I I do have a a bit of something special, oh. uh, so, you know who they are. Um, but you can you can go ahead. Do a quick one, and then I'll kick it over to you. I'll do a quick one. Oh, go for it. Um, I I have a I have an introduction I can say, and then you can actually speak on the individuals. Okay. Uh, DC scores. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. That was really lovely. Mm. Um, and looking forward to hopefully making you making another altar and see how that evolves as well. And, and honestly, thank you for just sort of the symbolic um, elements to your altar that was just very kind of just putting that very, uh, those, those really needed issues out there and appreciated that. Um, so DC Scores, we're going to have a nice poetry reading um, by a couple members of DC Scores. It is a program uh, that empowers children to find, uh, the youth to find academic success and grow into an emotionally and physically healthy teen and adult, ensuring children experience the joys of childhood through sports, arts, service, and being part of a team no matter their family circumstances. I'm really excited you actually introduced this to um, DC Scores and you know what it is that they do. You know, arts is such a valuable part of um, um, community and growth. So thank you for including DC Scores here. Go for it. You're on mute. I'm off mute now. And so, uh, so no, I just want to introduce DC Scores. Um, I got connected with them through a, a friend of mine at, at, at GW and they, subscribe to the newsletter and they they were i talked to them about this project and and tony got back to me and said that he thinks this would be a great program because in addition to dc scores um being an after school program that helps kids with soccer which is my other passion when i'm not doing this i just basically do soccer all the time um but they also teach the kids with poetry and after school stuff to make sure that it's a comprehensive learning experience where it's like it's physical and mental. And a lot of the students have, they do poetry, they do spoken word. And so when I spoke about this, they were really excited because they're demographic, a lot of their kids, it's almost 100% African-American and Latino. And this was a great opportunity for these communities to come together in a shared way to talk about their culture collectively. And so I'm uh, just really excited that DC Scores was able to participate. And I think I would, I will kick it to uh, Greta. Do, would you like to do the introduction and, and, and talk a bit more about DC Scores? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you again for having us. We are very, very excited to be here. We had so much fun with this project. Um, last week, we got together, built a community altar between Kanaya and Yanina, who are our two poets who will be sharing some work with you all. Um, but yeah, I'm going to share my screen. I too hate sharing my screen because all the things can go wrong. So hopefully this works. You can see it, head nod, thumbs up, perfect. Um, so this is Kanaya, she's in 11th grade. Kanaya has been with us for a few years. She's a DC Scores alum. Um, when we were approached with the project idea, Kanaya came to mind because she had performed um, a poem at an event. I'm gonna back up 
I'm Greta. I co-lead a spoken word workshop series with DC Scores poets who are interested in the poetry side of things, who are interested in honing their craft, working with poetry specialists that we bring in on weekends. Um, and Kanaya is a part of that group, so is Yanina. Uh, Kanaya did a poem two years ago at one of our showcases about a friend who passed away. Uh, so she popped into mind when we were thinking about working on this project. Uh, she's in 11th grade. She's a beautiful, beautiful poet. Um, and I'm excited for you all to see her work. We also have Yanina who also popped into mind when thinking about this project. Um, when we spoke to her about it, she was really intrigued about ethnocide. Uh, and I think it connects to a lot of the pieces that she does. She talks a lot about her culture. She's El Salvadorian in her poetry. Um, so she connected to that and that really came through in her work. Um, one of the most beautiful parts about working on this was just the amount of joy that we had in the room. I'm West African. When we think of death and funerals, it's really a celebration of life. So it, to be able to share that space with the girls was really, really fun for me. Um, we had a beautiful time creating the space, creating the altar, um, and just sharing space with each other. So they each perform two poems that I'm going to play for you all now. Let me know if the sound works. I hope it does. It's been two years since the tragedy. Two years since I walked down the street. Red and blue lights ride by. It ain't nothing new though. I see it all the time. I hopped in the back seat when I seen the river streams leaking from my sister's eyes and I'm thinking. Maybe she just had a bad day, you know? Until the waterworks turns into screams and cries and I know something ain't right. My mother recites the source of the waterworks and at first, I don't know how to respond. I can't even grasp the fact that he's not here anymore. I tell myself, ain't no way until the next day it hits me harder than before. I shed tears until my eyes are swollen and a piece of my heart feel like it's been physically stolen. I joined the peers whose nightmares became reality and focused my mind on trying to gain my confidentiality, but then I realized his blood forever rests on the hands of man, oh man, the world starts spinning, the room gets hot. Can't you feel what I felt when my head throbbed nonstop? And I started visualizing the scene until I actually seen the news, the pictures, the videos, the body, the tears, the blood. I keep telling myself, Kanaya, you have to be strong for others. So I stop the cries and put a pen to paper and decide to hide the pain and remember he's with God, the one who's never switched and has always been on my side. And I deprive, deprive deprive my thoughts that say he is a fine and remember that everything's for time so fly high they're killing me slowly i'm trying to hold on for dear life they stabbed me so many times my bloodline slowly seeps out my ancestors high and mighty with tears in their eyes just watching our culture's demise and we can no longer save it just enjoy the small pieces that will be left behind but as my culture slowly dies within me they pick up the blood and lather themselves in it tell themselves it's theirs and love every inch of it you start to notice they only love your culture resurrected in their wrong skin. Killed your love for it, a mortal sin. Wishing you could go and pick up the blood and lather yourself in it. Learn to love was once yours again. 
but it's whitewashed, it's lost its value, its authenticity, and now you have to adapt. Learn to love your mixed blood because it's the closest you'll ever get to your ancestors' art. Always remember though, these stolen goods, this stolen beauty, this stolen blood, they'll only be able to lather themselves in but they will never be able to feel the pride that my ancestors left in my blood. It's been two years. Okay, so that's Yanina and Kanaya's work that was their offering for the altar and the space. Um, I'm going to kick it off to Kanaya first to speak a little bit about her poem, um, her altar, and then we'll hear from Yanina as well. Kanaya. Hello, everybody. As you know, I am Kanaya. Um, and I wrote my poem two years ago when I found out that a peer and a friend of mine was murdered. And I feel like it was important to write it because as well as everyone, youth is so important and so overlooked in my eyes, like especially when it comes to safety and et cetera. And I just wrote it because I felt like I wanted to honor him and make sure that he was remembered, especially since I believe nobody, but he definitely did not deserve what he got. Thank you, Kanaya. Um, and next we have Yanina. Yanina, do you want to talk a bit about your inspiration for your poem, your altar space. Uh, yeah, um, so my poem, I am a Salvadorian, a proud Salvadorian American. Um, so my poem, I am very, well, even though I'm so mixed to the point, and I talk about this a lot as a Latina, as a mestiza, as they would say, I'm so far away from my indigenous culture and I try to pay tribute to it as much as I can through my poetry and try to speak on that because I feel like I have more indigenous features than I have what they would say Espanola features, Conquistadores features, but um, I try so hard to like be connected to that because it's still in my blood. You see it in my bloodline all the time and I try best um, to s speak on that. Um, and the altar, I honored um, an aunt that I had and one of my great grandmas uh, who lived to be 107 years old. So she lived a long, beautiful life and she's very important to me. Although I didn't meet her, but she definitely gave me and raised my mom and some of her traditions have also been passed down to me and some of her beliefs have all been also been passed on to me so I definitely felt like honoring her because you know if it wasn't for her I don't think I'd do a lot of the things that I already do within our culture so yeah awesome thank you both um and again thanks for having us this was a very very meaningful uh project for us to work on as a group it was the first time we've seen each other since February in like an actual physical space so it was it was great to come together again to meet up for this. Of all the ways to meet and to create something so beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I'm really glad that you guys were able to come together and and make your altars. And I, the thing that's really so powerful is how the stories that you guys told through your altars were so different, but yet they were still very it made sense for them to be in the same space, like literally in the same room and right next to each other. And I think like one thing for me as an African-American I, and, I, I, and as a journalist, 
I will do a lot of research and it will look, will look at politics and we'll see that like black and brown Americans by and large agree on almost all the same things politically. There'll be like a couple of things here or there, but by and large, we are like the same political group, but we don't find ways to work together politically. It'll be like the, the, the Latino group will do one thing and the African-American group will the, do the other thing. We have the same end goal, the same same objectives, but we don't collaborate. And one of my hopes was that this could cause a collaboration because there's two groups of people that live next to each other, interact with a lot, have the same beliefs, and they're not coming together to make the change that they want in society, then that's a really big problem. And so seeing the two of you literally in the same room telling vastly different stories indicative of different cultural experiences yet still the same in many ways is really really uh impactful and, and powerful for our society today and uh i just uh, I, I i thought your poems were great and uh, i'm really glad that you guys were able to participate thank you yes it was uh, exactly what kind of what barrett said is to see two such parallel experiences that, uh, you know, that carry so, s such a, an important part of the issues today that we're talking about, but to see it so personalized and raw in, in, in this, this generation of uh, Yanina and Kanaya is, is so important, right? It kind of strips everybody of the ego about what we're constantly bickering about and talking about i mean especially when you have these upcoming elections and to really give uh to, to just stop and listen and and make it so personal like you both were able to do with your art and your poetry was just so meaningful so thank you so much i mean i'm not saying that i'm completely like old or anything but it's so beautiful to see you all this youth and this generation so connected and so aware and present um, in a way that, you know, I think the, you know, when I think a little bit about even my generation, and, and again, I'm not like far, so far to make it feel like I'm completely older than you all either, um, in like a patronizing way at all. But, uh, you know, sometimes we have already accepted a little bit of like what I am living through. And so for you all, when you get to that voting age and you're at, you know, young adulthood, and if you choose to have a family and, you know, as you, as you have these relationships with your parents and, and your relatives getting older as well, you know, you know, what, what you, how you evolve into the, the person that who can make those decisions independently on your own. Um, it's so great to see that you all are so aware and, and, and are we, my generation and, you know, uh, your parents' generation, are we doing enough to, to give you enough um, agency to feel confident about your future? And I hope that we do. And for you all to be so vocal, it's, it's, it's such a refreshing and good reminder because again, uh, politically and in our neighborhoods, when we see change, you know, some of us can feel extremely righteous about like, are we doing it the right way? But what we forget is what are, what are we doing for our youth? What are we doing for our schools? And what are we um, ensuring that you have that safe space to just stay young and keep learning and um, are, are given all of the tools and resources to keep growing? And as well as like the empathy to allow you to make any mistakes and, um, you know, the, and be young still. So, um, so thank you for you all being here. I feel like sometimes as an adult, you know, I'm always learning more from, from younger people all the time because we as older people, you know, we think that we've experienced and learned and we, we think we know what we're talking about, but you know, that's not really the case we're just so stubborn about being flexible to sort of like the changing environment that we have. Yeah. I have a question for Kanaya and Yanina. What did you, how did you feel making the altar? Like we've had a lot of, you know, artists that, you know, making, I'm just curious, what did you guys feel and about the experience? And was this something that you've done before? 
Um, and then, you know, I'm just curious. You want to go first or why go first tonight? Um, you can go first. Um, so for us, we didn't, we weren't so used to, I've never really made one myself or my parents. We always like light a candle and we're like, oh, you know, and we say a little prayer over it or whatever. Um, but besides that, no, and it felt very different. Like I kind of got emotional at one point. I mean, uh, I was like thinking a lot and I was like, wow, like I, we don't do this enough. We don't really honor our ancestors as much as I would like to. And I like feel like it's definitely something that I want to implement um, in my, like during these times, especially for Dia de los Muertos. And I mean, we usually do this. Well, I don't know in many other countries if they do this, but I think it's like the 90th day we do something for um, those who have passed on or we do an oracion or a prayer or something like that. For the 90th day I think there has there's like certain days where we do it or a month a year you know we try to make sure we go put some flowers out but yeah I mean, it was definitely a very different feeling because I've never done it and especially to do it myself and have somebody else with me to also do it but it felt very different but it felt really unique and like I love the experience so I definitely do it again yeah I definitely agree with you, Nina. Um, I've never made an altar or created an altar before this, so it was a welcoming and a good experience, and I definitely feel like it should be practiced more. And it also had me thinking, and it just reminded me of how precious life is and how we take advantage of it so much that we don't even realize that in the blink of an eye, someone that you love or just anyone in general that you know can be gone. And so every moment we have to hold on to it and use every moment that we have wisely. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really great to hear. Um, I'm glad that you guys enjoyed it. I'll say, um, you know, this, the altars project, this is, this is you know, my idea in many ways. I've had a lot of great partners and collaborators to help get it to where it is right now. But I personally, have, I haven't been doing this for, you know, this isn't a family tradition. So even every year when I have to make an altar, uh, I hesitate because I know that I'll have to have all these feelings and think about stuff that I haven't had to think about all year. And it's like, it's really, it's really strange because uh, I think we get into routines where we, uh, we don't really consider it suppressing those feelings, just almost as if they don't exist. And you just are used to being without them, like as a part of you, which is really weird to say. But even, you know, even this year, I, I tragically dragged my feet on making my altar because I, I didn't want to like encounter all the feelings, but, uh, but it's a whenever I do it, I then feel good. Um, and so I'm glad that you guys enjoyed it and that it, it uh, you, you had a, it, it felt good, even though it's probably like a little awkward and scary <laughs> to a little a certain extent, but I'm really glad you participated in and your, uh, your poetry was really great. So, so thanks a lot. And from there, we're gonna kick it to our next, uh, our next person for the day, uh, Raquel. But uh, and I'll have say to do the introduction. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so thank you, Yanina and Kanaya. I mean, amazing. You all just left me a feeling. <laughs> but all right. So we have um, Raquel L, who's actually gonna um, help close us out for for the for the evening, and say some last words. And uh, so I will go ahead and introduce her. Raquel of Creative Mornings. She is a writer and filmmaker among many hats and has experienced her own personal loss and will close today's conversation and lead us into our moment of remembrance um, with Les. So go ahead, Miss Raquel. Uh, hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm going to try to get through this with no tears. Um, 
this night has been very touching for me, very profound. Sorry. I'm thinking of my mother. I lost my mother in 2019. And I don't think I really understood that I am walking remembrance. I am a walking altar to my ancestors and honestly to your ancestors too, because I'm connected to all of you. You are my family. We're all related. My skin may be a little darker or lighter. My language may be different, but I, I am of what you are. Um, and so seeing the poetry or hearing the poetry in the film, um, seeing the altars and just hearing people speak about why they choose to remember, why they want to honor, um, it just touched me. Like I'm a big crybaby. I wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, I'm just always searching for what's, what's bigger and greater than me. And remembering who came before me is that. Remembrance is that thing that can connect us because we're all going to lose people that we care about. And we all ourselves are going to pass. But the thing that can connect us, the thing that we all have in common is that we all have people that we love, that we want to honor. And in this time when we are so divided for whatever reason, that hopefully through remembrance, through honoring, through creating an altar, through creating things that can help us understand how important the tradition and rituals are, um, it can help unite us because it's nothing wrong with the individual. I love being Raquel, but I also love being part of, of human beings and of humankind and of this world. And that's what my mother taught me to be. I'm a good person, not just because of, not just, not just for my family, but because I know it serves a greater good. So just in this time, just, just, just think of that idea that you are walking remembrance because somebody poured into you with their love, with their stories, with their going to your soccer game. Um, you know, like, just that that's just what how it strikes me that I want us all to think about how important remembrance can be in keeping us connected, not just to our families and to our cultures, but to each other. Thank you, Raquel. And I, I, I echo everything that you're saying and we appreciate you being here so much. Uh, she came to, Raquel came to one of our events and she quickly became part of our family. And so we're just really happy that Raquel's here. And um, to, I'll say on my like inspiration for like this project, I, I have the, a bad habit of not thinking about myself that much. I think about like how this will impact other people. Um, and that like, I thought Black Lives Matter, the stuff happening to the African-American community, alters could be a very beneficial thing for our community to, to get out a lot of the trauma and the grief and create structure and things that we're trying to do. And seeing everybody here from, you know, my African-American community, but also the community of just all of us as Americans, cultivating and creating something has been really, really empowering. And, and when it comes to remembering that you're part of a group, I think for me, it's been really, easy from like a young age because I look just like my parents. Like if I'm around my mom, they say I look just like her. If I'm around my dad, I look just like him. So I always got a reminder that I was like an extension of somebody else for as long as I can remember. And so it's been, a, I've had a very hard time thinking of myself as an individual because I've always been one of two people <laughs> for my whole life. And so I'm just really glad that we are making a, such a great community here. And thanks for sharing Raquel. And so I'll kick it to Seda. Today was a, a really in introspective one. And, and I'm also a little surprised we were able to do that considering we wanted to kind of bring some other um, topics to that intersect of al altars. And I felt like it would have been more so yesterday. So I, I love that these, this is kind of playing out and organically um, the conversation is happening this way, which was 
I think is, is much more beautiful. But um, so Les is gonna kind of close out with some really, um, some of that same introspective um, music that you did for us in the beginning. Um, but please thank you all for joining today. Um, please RSVP for tomorrow if you would love to continue joining into this conversation. Um, I'll go ahead and put in the chat all of the additional information. I, I don't, don't feel like I want to ramble about all of that stuff because it's just such a beautiful moment to close. So check the chat for all the other stuff. Thank you all. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.